We're here in Philippians chapter 3, and we want to read some verses here, not all the chapter, but we'll read down through more than what we will be dealing with today. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ." And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Ending a reading at verse 11, and trusting that the Spirit will give us light in the Word. Once more, let's just still our hearts briefly, that the Lord will come and be with us. Lord, we bless Thee for the worship and praise that has already taken place. May our hearts be moved toward Thee, and may that be even intensified as the Word is opened. Give us light, give us understanding, give us the Holy Spirit. And grant, Lord, that thy word might have free course and be glorified. May every heart be opened to receive it. May it be molded by thy divine hand and made appropriate to everyone who is assembled. For all thy people and all those still without Christ. And so for this season, understanding our own weakness, we take the promised Spirit of God. Fill us with divine ability and enable us to articulate thy mind to this people. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had someone try to encourage you when you were going through a dark time and a dark patch and feel that they were being more condescending to you than actually helping you? The feeling that their efforts to try and help you with your difficulty were making you feel worse than better. That's sometimes the case, sometimes how we feel, especially when what we're going through is affecting our mental state and we are becoming depressed and downcast and it's affecting the very way we think. We very often will become critical of those trying to help us, feeling their powerlessness to do anything to benefit us. And one of the difficulties in trying to help people is this very thing. And trying to overcome that feeling of people rejecting our encouragement. If you've never been there, you may go through it at some stage. And certainly, uh, as I have visited in the past, sometimes those who are going through trying times, there is this feeling of not wanting to say anything that would seem patronizing or condescending. And yet, it's what we expect, isn't it? When those are going through dark times, or when we think of people going through trying times, we think of the responsibility others have to try and encourage them. We think this is a natural thing to do. They're going through the difficulty. Let me encourage them. And yet so often, the case is that it is those who are going through the hard times, especially those who are spiritual, when they're going through the hard times, they're actually more encouraging to us. Especially later on in life, I find, I love visiting the aged and those who have been on the road for a long time in the Christian life because they're so confident in the Lord, they have a a steadfast faith, 
And when you're looking at what they're facing, you're thinking, how are they dealing with it? And the fact of the matter is, they're dealing with it far better than you could ever imagine. And so we have the same here in the case of the Apostle Paul. Because he is the one imprisoned, he is the one restricted, he is the one who is uncertain about his future, perhaps staring death in the face in the very near future, and yet he is the one who says to those at Philippi, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. Don't be worried about me, don't be worried about yourselves, find joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I mentioned, I think in the very first message, about the difference, the distinct difference between happiness and joy. And we should keep that in mind. Many of you will know it and remember it, uh, but just to refresh your memory, the idea of happiness comes from the word hap, which has the idea of things happening by chance, occurring by chance. And our response then to those things that occur by chance affects our moods. And when we say, this happened and I rejoice, we are indicating the fact that we were not in control but that its effect or our response to that development, that providence, that thing that occurred in our lives caused us to be happy or on the other side of the coin caused us to be sad. This is various things happen in our lives that indicate this. Uh, things People in the, even without the Lord Jesus experience happiness. We talk about the happiest day of their life being their wedding day. Maybe years down the line they t take that back. I don't know. Uh, but when the birth of a child or some other occasion or event or getting through university, seeing your children go through university, all these things, events that take place uh, that we remember as being times of happiness. And they may even occur at times when we are going through a great trial and give us a little alleviation, a little lift in the midst of our trial. We're feeling happy in the moment and when the event ends and the happening comes to an end, we go back into our slump and despondency as we wake up on a new day and face the same trials. Happiness. It may happen. It may not. Our response to that may vary. But joy is different. Joy is completely unrelated to circumstances. It is not attached to anything that occurs with regard to our day-to-day -day events and what we face. Joy is something that we get from our relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Son of God. It is a grace that we receive of Him, and we should never mix the two up. We may talk about being joyful as Christians, but what we're really experiencing is happiness in what is occurring in our lives at that present time, because we may be happy as Christians and yet spiritually miles away from the Lord. I know people like that. I've met people like that. And their whole demeanor is one of joy. Spiritually, though, they are away from the Lord. And so what they're experiencing is a temporary happiness, but it's not joy that stems from a relationship and communion with Jesus Christ. When we are in communion with Christ, we have what the Bible refers to as joy, biblical joy, spiritual joy, the joy referred to in Galatians 5, the joy exhorted throughout the book of Philippians, the joy that the people of God know and only they know. Now, you may tell me that the happiest people you know are people that aren't even Christians. The happiest person you ever met with a demeanor that would just light up a room just sunshine on their face almost the entire time that you have ever known them. And you say, well, they're, they're not Christians. How can that be? Well, they're just happy demeanor. And they have a positive frame of mind. And perhaps if you knew, knew more about them in the secret place and in the quietness of their own hearts, everything was just an act. But joy isn't fraudulent. Joy is not put on. Joy is something that God gives in spite of what's occurring. Joy is something that Jesus Christ purchased by His precious blood to be the experience of all who are His people. It is a birthright. It is our permanent possession. And the question is, do we know anything of it today? Because we should. We should. If Jesus upon the cross at Calvary died to give me joy, then what is wrong with me if I do not possess it? 
Is there any want in His desire to give it to me? No. The want is with us. The want perhaps is in our communion or lack thereof. We're going to be considering the opening three verses of this chapter under the title, Rejoicing in the Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord. And I trust the Lord will use this text to help us wherever we are at present and be a means of encouragement to us all. The first thing I want you to note with me is the people who rejoice in the Lord. The people who rejoice in the Lord. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And Paul uses the word finally sometimes, and the way preachers sometimes use it. They say this word finally, or in conclusion, and you think, well, he's nearly done, and then he goes on and on and on. Well, that's what Paul does. He's only halfway through here. He uses the word finally, and then he's going to use it again in chapter 4, verse 8, finally, brethren, uh, and, and the same language. Of course, what he's actually doing is bringing in a new stream of thought. It's still connected with what he has said, but he's kind of just breaking the, 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 the stream of what he has been dealing with and entering into something else. Finally, my brethren, he says, my brethren. And he tells them, rejoice in the Lord. My brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And he could only address such language to those he could say, my brethren. He could not exhort those outside of Christ to rejoice in the Lord. It would be a complete waste of time to give exhortation or for me to stand here before you this morning and say to you, and you're not saved, you don't know the Lord, you're not in Christ, you're a rejecter of the gospel up until this point, for me to tell you, just rejoice in the Lord. You're facing troubles and trials today, you don't know what the future holds, just rejoice in the Lord. That would be a waste of my breath and energy. We cannot give this language, present this language to those who we cannot also say are my brethren. This is a text for the people of God. If you are in the family of God, if you're a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, you're one who knows the Lord, and we have that connection, beloved, let us not forget it. We are one in Christ. We are the one family. We're many members of one body. We are to love one another, care for one another, and speak to one another in such caring language. And also, give this kind of exhortation. My brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Only those who are the people of God can experience this joy, as we have said. This is something for all of God's people. But how do we identify the brethren? You'll know anyway. Many of you will know who the brethren are and how to identify them. Because they've been saved. You know that. That's the only way we can be sure of that. Or the only language, rather, we would use about those kind of people. We would say, my brethren, about those who have been saved. You know that. But he identifies them in verse 3. So we're going to skip down to that. Verse 3, where he gives credentials or characteristics or very statements that relate to those who could, he, whom he could call my brethren. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then he says, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. These are the brethren. These are the people of God, and these are those who can rejoice in the Lord and should rejoice in the Lord. And I've said before, sometimes I look down in your faces and I wonder, I wonder, is there any joy? I know joy is not always something we display in our faces, but better that we should uh, if we can at all. We are the circumcision. Let's look at these different phrases and statements that he uses to clarify who the brethren are. We are the circumcision. What does he mean by that? Well, many of you will know what circumcision was in a biblical context. You'll know where it comes from. It comes from the Old Testament. It comes from that sign that God gave to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. He said, by this sign, you'll be my people. And he, th that sign was a sign of circumcision. It was a sign that he gave to Abraham, an outward sign of them being cut off as a people from the world onto the Lord. They were a people set apart. Abraham had been set apart from his father's house. He'd been set apart from Ur of the Chaldees. He'd been brought into this new land that would, was promised to him and to his posterity. He had been cut off. The sign, the symbol of being a people cut off was the sign of circumcision. 
The act itself did not save. Abraham knew that. Don't misunderstand the revelation of the Old Testament. Don't do as many do and misunderstand these various signs as being understood to be salvific to those who received them or were given them. It was not. Abraham was in no doubt about the fact that this was just a sign. It didn't save him. How was Abraham saved? He believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You see, what does a sinner need? What does a sinner like Abraham need? What does a sinner like you need? We need righteousness. That's what we need. That is the crying need of every sinner. It is to have righteousness because we don't have righteousness, men and women. We don't have any righteousness of our own. If we are to look at our righteousness, and Paul goes on to talk about that which he considered his righteousness, he counted it dung. Why did he count it dung? Because God himself says it's dung. Even the, the righteousness which you do are filthy rags, we find in the prophet Isaiah. Filthy rags. Filthy rags. Even the good things. We don't have righteousness. And that's what we need before a righteous God. And Abraham's salvation came because he believed God. And that was accounted to him for righteousness. But a sign was given. A sign to show that he was cut off. His people were cut off. And the act itself didn't do anything. It just symbolized what's needed in the heart. That the heart needs to have its hardness cut out, surgically removed. The Word of God is, is, of course, the instrument that God uses to circumcise the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is quick, that is alive. It's a living word and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the language basically is just saying that the Word of God cuts to the very heart of man, that there's nothing hidden. And you may be here this morning and you have hidden sins. And you think you can hide these sins from God. And you think these sins don't really matter to God. But God's Word exposes you in your sin. And you know it. Your conscience pricks you. You understand you're condemned before God's holy Word. And if you go down through the law of God, you know you are condemned. You are a lawbreaker. You have no righteousness. And this is what you need. It's what we all need, righteousness. Paul says the brethren are those who have received the Word of God in a life-changing way, essentially. We are the circumcision. We have had our hearts circumcised. We are the true circumcision. We are those who have truly been cut off from the world, regenerated, born again, and made the spiritual children of God. You say, well, are you sure that's how the Old Testament men and women understood circumcision? Did they know that it only reflected what they needed in their hearts? Did they know that? And I say to you, they did very clearly. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Circumcise, Moses says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Their stiff neck, their stubbornness, their hardness against God, their hardness against His Word revealed the fact they had not yet been spiritually circumcised. They needed to have that hardness removed and by the removal of that hardness, they would then show that they were truly the people of God, truly circumcised. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. You see, they couldn't love the Lord with all their hearts until their hearts were circumcised. You can't love God. The great commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you can't even begin to fulfill that if your heart first has not been circumcised. Changed. Born again is the language Jesus uses to Nicodemus. If that has not taken place, if you have not had the spiritual birth in Christ, you can never love God. Never love God. That's what he says. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love God. The Lord of thy God, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. You see, when our hearts circumcised, when we have been changed, transformed, we received Christ in all of his fullness, 
and had this, 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 this surgical operation upon our nature, we're changed and become new creatures in Christ, and we become the brethren, become the people of God. We become the circumcision, he uses in verse 3. Jeremiah uses similar language. Jeremiah 4, verse 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. And then he expresses the state of the people of God, the house of Israel, in his day and generation in Jeremiah 9, 26. All the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. They had had physical circumcision on the eighth day as Paul had, but they hadn't had their hearts circumcised. They were uncircumcised in heart. That's why the judgment of God was hanging over them and coming upon them. If you have had this circumcision in heart, you're more Jewish than any ethnic person who can lay claim to an ethnicity of being Jewish. You're more Jewish than they are. You're more Jewish than any man who's unconverted living in Israel and can see his whole family line way back to whoever, even though they can't trace their family line with any great deal of accuracy these days. You're more Jewish than they are. You're more circumcised than they are. You're more the people of God than they are. This is what Paul says in Romans 2, the latter part of that chapter. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. See, the Jew found their praise of men. <laughs> I am of Abraham's seed. Like Paul articulates later on in this chapter, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, so on and so forth. I have all these things. This is the praise of men. Paul says, I count it dung. Why? It doesn't mean anything to God. If my heart has not been changed, if my heart has not been circumcised, I'm still a wretch. I'm still outside the family of God. And all my claims to anything in the flesh means nothing. It has no value. We who are saved this morning have been cut off from the world and brought to Christ. And that's why we experience true joy. <laughs> the brethren rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because we are the circumcision, beloved. We are. Not by our own efforts. Not by pride in our family heritage. But by a miracle of the new birth. A point in time when God changed your heart. Took away that stony heart and gave you a heart of flesh. You may not remember the date, but you know something has changed. You know that you're a child of God this morning. You have joy. You have peace. You have the experience of communion with Jesus Christ. You know God has your heart. And you love Him. He's everything to you today. We also worship God in the Spirit, he says. Look at verse 3 again. We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. Who worships God in the Spirit? Who? Only those who have had their hearts circumcised. Only those who are the brethren, who have had the saving work of the Spirit and the true circumcision, the real circumcision that matters before God. And the word worship here has the idea of service. And that's how it's most often translated, if I remember correctly, in my study, which serve God in the Spirit. The idea of serving God. So it's not just about being here on a Sunday morning. If, if it said worship and it was just, we had in our minds this picture of being in the house of God and worshiping together, then we might not think about the rest of the week. But that's not the language which serve God in the Spirit, serving God all our lives, a service to God. We keep home, we serve God in the home. Out in the workplace, employment, serving God there. The very demeanor about which you go about your business and do your work ought to be showing that you're serving God. You ought to be different. You ought to be different. The very attitude of our lives are a living sacrifice unto God, given over to God. Everything we do is with an eye to Him, since we are those who have received the Spirit. We worship God in the Spirit. We worship God in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has made His residence your heart. You cannot but feel the compelled to serve God in the Spirit. 
You, you feel it compelling, don't you? I must serve God. Even when you're far away and you're not where you should be, there's this, this drawing, I must serve God. I have to serve God. I have to speak for God. I have to be faithful to God. I have to pray to God. I am being drawn because I have the Spirit of God in me. We are also those who rejoice in Christ Jesus. And rejoice in Christ Jesus. The word rejoice here is not what is used in verse 1, nor is it the word that is used in any of the other references to joy or rejoice. It's different. The idea here is that of boasting or glorying. We are those who glory in Christ Jesus. We boast in Christ Jesus. This is, again, a peculiar attitude of those who have been tr truly saved. We make our boast in Christ. This is what the brethren do. They make their boast in the Lord Jesus. They continually give Him the glory. We do not live our lives saying, well, you know, I did that. <laughs> we had any impact in somebody's life, or we did any good that someone says that this wonderful thing you did there, it will be always the natural reaction of the people of God to say, well, it's not me, it was the Lord. It's not me, it's the Lord. And people will say, well, I know it was the Lord, but the Lord used you, and that's all fine. But in and in the heart of the child of God, there's always this withdrawing, this withdrawing from praise. Because we know that even though, as Paul says, he labored more than they all, he labored more than all the other apostles, it was not me, but the grace of God that was in me. It was all the Lord. What I do is the Lord. It's not man. And that's what the true child of God will do. He'll always ascribe glory to God. And when we get to heaven, what do they do with their crowns, beloved? What do they do with their crowns? And you hear some choruses and songs sometimes that, that talk about us and our crowns, and we're going to put on our crowns. And again, it's this kind of day of, of, of great, I don't know, us receiving our reward, and there will be a reward, and so on. But what do we do with the crowns? What do they do? They cast them before the feet of Christ. That's what they do with them. They cast them before the feet of the one who is worthy. They've received crowns for their faithfulness to God. And they realize, my faithfulness is because of Him. And all that I ever did was because of Him. And all that I am was because of Him. And so this is not mine, it's His. They glory in the Lord. In Jeremiah, in chapter 9, there's a passage there that's quoted by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But I'll not read the passage in 1 Corinthians. I'll read the original reference in Jeremiah 9 and verse 23. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me. That's what we glory in. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. Man looks down and says, well, look at your mighty deeds and look at your tremendous wealth. Look at this and gives glory. But the man who knows the Lord who is in this position, who may receive glory and praise from men, he's not looking to that. His glory is this. He understands and knows the Lord. I mean, this is the great treasure. This is the pearl of great price. And you can have everything. You have the praise of the entire world. But it's Christ. That means everything. And Paul declares, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God forbid I should glory in anything. We're going to see how he shows that later on in this chapter. Should I find glory in anything? Should I find any praise, any joy in any of my achievements? No. No, what are they but temporary things that occur? My joy is this. As Jesus says to the successful disciples, your name's written in heaven. Your name's written in heaven. And so, beloved, take that to heart. Take that to heart this morning. As you think of what could have been or what might be or all the disappointments in your life, and realize you're not mighty and you're not great and you haven't done tremendous things that people might glorify you because of. Don't worry about that. Glory in this, that I know Him. My glory is the fact He has opened my heart. These things are revealed unto babes. 
And that God has opened my heart and I'm a child of His. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. If I have nothing else to rejoice in today, if my life is so despondent, if my, if my, if my affairs are so negative that I can find no good thing, let me look to Christ Jesus and rejoice. That's what bears the people of God through in their hard times. That solid rock, Jesus Christ. And have no confidence in the flesh. That's what he says. They have no confidence in the flesh. The brethren, the people of God, the people who rejoice in the Lord have no confidence in the flesh. None. Absolutely none. They do not trust in themselves. They do not believe in their ability to make themselves right with God. They have no confidence in any ceremony or sacrament. And the context there... With relation to circumcision, they, they, they have no weight. If they had been circumcised, they have no weight on that. But it's not just that, it's in anything. They find no reason to be confident about anything that has come from man or been done by them or done by another. It's not in themselves. The brethren, you see, know this. Paul writes in Romans 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God, what is it in part? Joy in the Holy Ghost. I am in the kingdom. I'm a child of this kingdom. And what's my experience? Joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Do you have it, beloved? And if not, why not? Why are you overcome by circumstances? Why is it that when things happen, your faith, it crumbles, it seems? Why is it that it's so shallow, this relationship you have with Jesus Christ, that causes you not to have what the apostle articulates the believer should have? Where does the problem lie? Where does the problem lie? These are the brethren. These are the people who rejoice in the Lord. Secondly, the prescription to rejoice in the Lord the prescription. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. We're looking at the statement now. Rejoice in the Lord. The command in the prescription, rejoice. This is a command. Rejoice. It's not a suggestion. It's not an idea. It's not, this should be in your life, you know. Or Christians would be more productive and better if they had this. It's not that. It's command. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. This is what you must do as a child of God. If you find you can't know this experience, that you don't have this experience, you don't know what the apostle is talking about, or it's been so long since you've had it, you need to go seeking for it. You need to go after it. You need to cultivate it. And you cannot be at peace unless you have it. If you're resistant to joy, and it amazes me that some are professing believers resistant to joy, it's like they get some kind of kick out of being melancholy all the time. I don't understand that. But some are like that. And if you're a child of God, claiming the name of Jesus Christ, you're in direct disobedience to this command. If you're the type of person who wakes up on the Monday morning, hating Monday mornings, hate Mondays, all Mondays, round again, using that language, where have you learned that? Where have you learned that language from? The Bible? The people of God learned it from the world. They hate Mondays. They have no joy in a Monday. Why? Because their whole life revolves around Friday and Saturday. And whenever things they get up to on Sunday, maybe even just recovering on Sunday, they can't hate Sunday because they're that out of it. They're just trying to recover and prepare themselves for the week that lies ahead. Is that the language of the people of God? I, I see this, you know. I hear this people, professing Christians, going on like the drag that is Monday. What are we to do, beloved? Rejoice in the Lord. God's given me another day. He could have cut me off and he should have if he was to look at me for what I am outside of Christ. And to be so hateful and to be so unthankful, which is one of the things of the last days, isn't it? Being unthankful. You find it in Romans 1, you find it also when Paul's writing to Timothy that they will be unthankful. And we are unthankful. Wake up on a Monday, oh, a Monday. 
this is not to be found or named among the people of God. It's a sin. Let's not call it anything else. The command is to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. So we have a responsibility to make it happen. If the command comes to you to go or do or whatever it might be, you know you're responsible to, to obey the command, carry it out. But when it comes to an, a state like this, like joy, we are inclined to say, well, God will give it to me if he so desires. I'm telling you, God has commanded you to, be rejoice, to rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> and we should be on our knees crying out to God to make us know something of this and not get up until we know it. Give me joy. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you start to rejoice in the Lord? You think about all he's done for you. Just think of the cross. Think about where you should be. Where should you be? Perishing. Firewood of God's hell. We have no reason not to rejoice. And those are just the extremes. I'm sure every day if you thought more carefully, you'll find reasons to rejoice in the Lord. Let me ask you, is God worthy of the excitement and energy of your being? Is he worthy of your passion? Or can we be careless about how we feel before the Lord? Is he worthy of your exercising yourself to find your most positive emotions in him? Is he worthy of that? exercising myself to find my most positive emotions in him or is it the case that other things excite us more than him other things excite us other things cause us to have more joy other things hobbies people family <laughs> we can all fall into this trap you know what that is when we find more joy in anything else but god what is it what is it idolatry it's idolatry that's what it is. We're breaking the command of God. To find more joy in anything else but God is idolatry. Do you find in the Apostle Paul him finding joy in anything more than in Christ? <laughs> Let me go down through these verses. And I read them to you to give you a flavor of what he's going to get into. Everything was dung. It was all dung. <laughs> you won't take away my hobbies, take away... My, take away my health. You take away everything. It doesn't matter. It's all done. I've won Christ. That's it. That's what my life revolves around, my entire existence. Your outward reflection of emotion toward the Lord has an impact upon others, beloved. Never forget it. When we have a joy in the Lord, I believe the Spirit of God uses that to minister to other people, even when we're not aware of it. This is the command and the prescription. Rejoice. And the criterion of the prescription is in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Just highlight this and underline this. Finding our joy in Christ alone. Rejoicing in the Lord. All true joy is found in our relationship with Christ. Communing, serving, worshipping, speaking of Him. It's all to be in Him and toward Him. True joy. You know, Jesus said to His disciples in John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. My joy. My joy. There was never a person more joyous than Jesus Christ. He had joy above his fellows. And he looked to the cross and he stepped into all that it entailed with joy. And we are to have the same joy. If the world comes at us with a cross, if our experiences bring us to a cross, we are still to have joy in Christ. Because he went through the cross for us. He has led the way by example in this for us. And the more we have of him, the more we have of joy. And the more we have of joy, the more joy we have. It's all in Christ. I wonder, do you desire more joy? You know, things are sold based on joy. Things are sold. Most marketing endeavors are around our, our joy, or more accurate to say, our happiness. They sell cars, and they sell vacations, and they, they, they sell, 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 sell you because you're seeking happiness. You buy, 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 buy. Oh, if we move to that location, a bigger house, more happiness. You know, when they sell the adverts, 
They always see these smiling faces, don't they? There's never anybody but a glum moving into a new house. In spite of the fact <laughs> that the, the, very, the very experience of moving house is one of the most stressful you can go through, everybody's always happy. And when you're driving a car, you know, the impact that has on everybody, how everybody looks at you and selling happiness. Selling happiness. And Christians fall into it, don't we? We buy based on the promise of happiness. But how frivolous we are. How frivolous. Do you desire joy, beloved? Do you desire joy? Joy that supersedes happiness, that every morning you have this sense of joy. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for the privilege of being your child. Thank you for being able to work or live out my life and the responsibilities you have given me. Thank you. Thank you for this sickness because I am learning what you suffered. Thank you for this hardship because by it I am being conformed more to Christ. It's an answer to my prayer to be more like Him. Thank you, Lord. I can rejoice in these things. This is, this is what we are to have. When He is your joy and it's Him where you find all your joy, then you will understand this more. Thirdly and very quickly, the prevention to rejoicing in the Lord. I'll deal with this as quickly as I can. Because he says, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. There are things that attack our joy, things that the devil uses to prevent us experiencing what is our birthright in Jesus Christ. And one of them that is most effective is that of false teaching, false teachers, false doctrine, false ideas. And this is what he addresses. This is his burden. This is why he is writing these things. To write the same things onto you. This is why I repeat myself sometimes. Paul had to repeat myself. And I think what he's doing is harking back to verse 28 of chapter 1. And are nothing terrified by your adversaries. He's going back to the adversaries. Those who were attacking. Those who were threatening the church. Those who were on the doorstep. I don't think that they were penetrating the church at Philippi at this stage. But they were pressing. They were pressing. And their influence was being known. These adversaries. And now he articulates who the adversaries are. And he tries to warn them so that they don't fall into the trap. And these adversaries are highlighted in verse 2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Three bewares. He is heightening the emphasis. You can't miss that, can you? Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. They're all relating to the same group of people. They're all relating to the same cluster of those who are attacking the church with ferocity. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. What is he talking about? Well, don't be too offended by the language of Paul when he refers to dogs. Some of us like dogs. I love dogs. Um, many of us love dogs. But what he is doing here is painting a picture of what those in the ancient world would have understood. In the ancient world, wild dogs would move about in packs like wolves. And they were aggressive. People needed to be wary of them needed to drive them away, they would have carried disease, they would be scavengers, they would generally just be a nuisance even to threaten human life at times. And this was the, Jew, the word the Jews would use re with regard to the Gentiles. They would call them dogs. They would call the Samaritan dogs, and Jesus even refers to that when he's talking to the Syrophoenician woman and talks about the crumbs that fall off the table and so on. And she says even the dogs get the crumbs. So there is this idea of dogs, and what he's referring to here are those called the Judaizers. The Judaizers, just in brief, were those who, to a part, to a degree, said they accepted the gospel, that they had some belief in Jesus Christ, but they marred and tarnished the gospel by adding in elements of the Mosaic law. And the main one was circumcision. And I don't have time to go through the scriptures and show you where they come out over and over and over again, but this was the main attack against the church. This was one of the main battles that the, the church had to face. And when Paul writes his most strongest language against a particular sect that were against the gospel, it's to these people. The book of Galatians. He calls them accursed. He, he, he has no time for them. He is not sympathetic. He uses the most harsh language against them. And he calls them here dogs. He turns their own language about the Gentiles onto themselves. He says they're like dogs. They go around in packs like scavengers. They go around and you need to be wary of them because they will attack because they carry a disease. And if that disease gets you, you will die. 
and they're carrying about doctrine, if it gets into your bloodstream, you will perish. You beware of dogs. They took things and they said, one needs to have circumcision in order to be justified before God. They must be, ju they must be circumcised. They must be circumcised. If they're not circumcised, they're not right before God. And so there were these Christians, especially those who were Jewish, who had accepted the gospel, and then they were being influenced, and they were starting to go into Gentile areas and preach a gospel that was Jesus Christ plus circumcision. This was permeating certain churches and areas, and Paul is so angry. He is so upset. He is so wary of them. And he's saying, do not accept this. Beware of dogs. They will destroy key doctrine of justification, if you're wrong on that, as I've said before, you will perish. That we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone is something we cannot give up. And you say, well, are they alive and well today, the Judaizers? Yes, they are. They're alive and well today. They're just not called Judaizers. They have other labels. You think of any group that takes the name of Jesus Christ and then adds something else and says, this is also necessary. You think of anybody? Roman Catholic Church, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, I could go on and on. What do they do? They take the name of Christ, but they add in things. If you're not baptized in our church, you'll perish. If you're not in our group, if you're not part of the watchtower, you're outside the camp. If you're not part of the LDS, if you're, if you're not in our little temple, if you're not part of our little clique, you're not a Christian. They're adding things. What did they add? They had all sorts of things. They add baptism. They had other sacraments and other means that they, they add in. What did they do? They're just modern day Judaizers. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. You need to be wary of them, beloved. Anybody who says it's Christ plus this, it's not the gospel. And some will charge us. Sometimes we will say that the Christian life requires certain adherence to this, that, and the other. And they'll say, legalist. That's what they'll say, you're a legalist. If I say we should live a holy life as Christians, they'll say you're a legalist. Or we should conduct ourselves in a certain manner, or we should abstain from certain practices. Legalist. But they don't even understand the term they use. A legalist is someone who distorts justification and says to be justified, you add in these things. I, we, you will never hear that. I trust you will never hear that from this pulpit. When you're justified, it will change your life. But we're not saying it's tied into your justification. And so there are things I think that should be becoming of a Christian. Some things I believe are right for a Christian to adhere to and follow. But someone may say, well, I don't see it just like that. And I say, I don't cast them out and say, well, you're not part of us. So you don't adhere to this little element. You're not a Christian. I don't deal with them like that. They've been justified in Christ. Beware of evil workers. This is what they do. Actively working, actively working, evil workers. This is their employment, spreading their lies. Beware of the concision. He doesn't use the word circumcision here because he wants to show the distortion of the message. Concision essentially is the word mutilation. He calls them beware of the mutilation. Because that's what they did. They mutilated themselves. And they told others to mutilate themselves. They told them, you must have Christ and then be circumcised. Mutilation of the body. Now, the interesting thing is that when it came to Timothy, Paul told Timothy to be circumcised. But it had nothing to do with the justification. It was in order for Timothy to have a ministry among the Jews because he had a Jewish heritage from his mother's line and he had an opportunity to minister to Jews. And Paul says, look, if you're circumcised, you'll have this. Because his dad was probably a Greek. That's probably why he wasn't circumcised as a child. So he says, be circumcised. You'll be able to influence and get into the synagogues to be able to teach. But he wasn't tying the act to his justification. It was in order to minister. Minister the word to the Jews. That was it. That was it. But they were saying that you had to be mutilated like this. This, this has to take place in the body or you're not saved. And Paul calls it concision or mutilation. That's what it is. It's a false circumcision. And these people are about today, beloved. They tell you things and teach you things that are adding into the gospel. You need to be watched. You need to watch so that you don't fall into their traps. So, how do we end this? Rejoice in the Lord. 
Rejoice in the fact that verse 3 applies to you this morning. Verse 3 applies to you, just as we close it. We are the circumcision. I'm the circumcision. I didn't have to be born ethnically a Jew. God's changed me and made me a true Jew, truly circumcised in heart. I worship God in the Spirit, and I rejoice in Christ Jesus. I have no confidence in the flesh. What has made this a reality to you, beloved? It's just the free grace of God. The free grace of God. There's not one of us that can say, well, I earned this. Or I did something in order to achieve this. Or God foresaw that I would receive this. No, 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 no. It's been a gift, freely given. We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And so I say, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Go out of here and just say, I am determined to rejoice in the Lord more. More. Maybe you are the most joyous person in this fellowship. You, you, you just have it. But try to even have it more. Have more joy. And face your trials with joy and say, this, this isn't going to get me down. This is the command to rejoice in the Lord. I am going to set my mind to rejoice in the Lord in the face of the furnace of fire I am in. I'm going to rejoice. Because nothing will separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. There's no condem condemnation in me. Whatever the world throws at me, whatever providence brings my way, I can I will rejoice in the Lord. Let's bow together in prayer.